Mixing Dolby Atmos over the past couple of years has been an amazing experience and an eye-opening one at that. Today, I'm going to take you around the studio and show you all the equipment that it takes to make this possible. I created all the 160 Dolby Atmos tracks on the Spatial Audio Calibration Toolkit in this studio, and that doesn't include the 50 or so we actually had to create to make sure everything was correct and kind of figure out how Atmos is working in the production side and how it related to the consumer side, because there is a disconnect there. And I'm sure you've you know heard me say that before if you watch my channel at all in the past few months. I've also created a few of my own Dolby Atmos remixes on some of my favorite electronic music tracks. And I'll leave a link down in the description for you guys to check those out and play those on your Dolby Atmos home theater. They'll be in MP4 format, so you have to put them on a thumb drive and uh, find a player that will play that. All right, let's get on with the tour. At the heart of the setup is my M1 MacBook Pro 13 inch from 2018. The laptop connects to this new dock from OWC called the Thunderbolt Go. I can connect two Thunderbolt devices, one of which being my Thunderbolt SSD external hard drive and the other being my 16 channel audio interface, which we will check out in just a second. The Thunderbolt Go dock also allows me to connect my laptop via HDMI to a monitor. In this case, it's a 48 inch LG OLED C2. It also gives me two USB-A and one USB-C to connect more hard drives and SSDs. And all it takes is one Thunderbolt port to connect to my 13 inch M1 and we're all good to go. Next, we have a 16 channel audio interface from Universal Audio called the X16. This offers 16 channels of analog input and output so I can mix on a 9.1.6 Atmos configuration. Currently though, I am running an 11 channel Atmos configuration, a 7.1.4 as it's most commonly known. But I will be talking about upgrades later on in the video. So the audio goes from the laptop to the audio interface and then into this 16 channel amplifier from Niles called the 1650. I believe it has been discontinued now, so I was lucky to pick this up two years ago. The Niles 1650 is a whole home amplifier that outputs 50 watts per channel into 8 ohms with 16 channels driven, or 100 watts per channel into 4 ohms with 16 channels driven. Normally, Atmos Studios will use self-powered monitors, but that would require two cables to go to each speaker, one for signal and the other for power. I could have gone this route, but I went with passive speakers and I'll tell you why. On the right hand side, we have an 11 channel AVR by Pioneer, the LX505. I use this consumer AVR to listen back to my mixes and make sure they are translating correctly to a consumer level product. The Pioneer LX505 has 11 outputs via RCA, which like the 16 channel audio interface also goes into the Niles amplifier. So I can use the same passive speakers for the Atmos production side and then again for the Atmos consumer side to check my mix. So if I went with traditional studio monitors, I'd have to have one cable from the audio interface, one cable from the Pioneer and then a power cable. So that's three cables per speaker. Multiply that by 11 speakers. That's a lot of cabling. And so that's why I decided to go this way where there's only one cable going to a speaker and both the audio interface and the consumer level AVR will kind of just go into the amplifier and then the sound will go out through the speakers through the one cable. So it took me a quite a while to figure out what the best way to run this setup was. And that was what I came up with. And it's been working out very well so far. So I'm super stoked about it. Now let's talk about speakers. So a couple of years ago, I picked up some small mixing speakers, but they were not doing the trick as their frequency response was not the greatest. My buddy Joe showed me the new THX monolith satellite speakers, which have a concentric design and a camera mount screw thread at the bottom of the speaker. This was huge. Also, the speakers measure very well, relatively flat down to 80 Hertz. These speakers are also not that expensive, 250 per pair, but I would need about six pairs for an 11 channel setup. So around $1,500. All the speakers are on mic stands. So I was able to set them up in the perfect spots around the room and I can adjust their height with ease. My subwoofer resides underneath my desk at the rear of the room and it is the Focal Sub 6 11 inch studio subwoofer, which I picked up strictly for the LFE channel coming from the 16 channel audio interface. 
So most of the times with subwoofers in a studio environment, they have a left and a right input and output, but they don't have a specific or a designated LFE input. The Focal does, and that's why I picked up the Focal, and that's what I use along with the Monolith THX satellite speakers in my 7.1.4 configuration for Atmos mixing. Now on the consumer side, when I need to check my mix, I don't use the Focal sub. I use the SVS PB1000 Pro, which is connected to the Pioneer LX505 via the LFE output. So I have a full 7.1.4 mixing setup and a full 7.1.4 consumer setup in this room, which is huge when I need to check the mix and make sure that everything is moving around the room properly. And so the speakers are on mic stands and they needed some adapters. So that costs a little bit of money. And then the speaker stands cost a considerable amount of money. And the cables, I kind of didn't go super crazy expensive on the speaker cable because I knew I would need a lot of cable to um, set up this room. So I went with something fairly inexpensive, nothing crazy. And then there is the software that's needed to create Atmos, uh, convert the files and actually deliver something that you guys can play in your home theater, right? Now that software, some of them are, you know, yearly licenses. Some of them you have to purchase outright, but that's anywhere from about six to $10,000. So yeah, not cheap. Another huge addition is this folding tabletop. It wasn't too expensive and it serves a great purpose. I can mix in the middle of the room where all the speakers are equidistant from me and it really does mimic the Dolby Atmos renderer, which I think is a big deal. And the tabletop is great because I can fold it and move it out of the way. But if I also need to actually create something, my 49 key MIDI keyboard will fit here without any issues. All right, so now you're probably thinking, okay, well, this is all fine and good, but how did you level match and time align all the speakers in the Atmos mixing environment. And that's easy. I use the Direct Live processor. Now, for those of you that are unfamiliar with the Direct Live processor, it's pretty much just like Direct Live, but you are able to add the processor and all the Direct Live processing to the master channel of the mixing environment so that all the speakers are level matched and time aligned, including the subwoofer, which you can imagine is very important. Now what's cool with the Direct Live processor is that you can actually create a bunch of different presets for different types of speaker environments if you like. I just ran it to the basic, whatever uh, default flat that they had so that I could have a mix that I know will translate when we're talking about frequency and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. It's definitely good. If you have an Atmos mixing studio, I would recommend getting the Direct Live processor. I'll put links down in the description. And if you're wondering, it's pretty much just like running Direct Live on your AV receiver. Coincidentally, the Pioneer LX505 also uses Direct Live. So my mixing environment is using Direct Live. My consumer environment that I'm using to check the mix is also using Direct Live. So I get a pretty good idea of what it's gonna sound like in the mixing room and then what it's gonna sound like in your room. So that's pretty much it. Now, if you've hung out this long, well, I've got a little treat for you, right? Got a little something special. So at the beginning of the video, if you recall, I said at the heart of the system is 13 inch M1 MacBook Pro, right? Okay, there's good reason for that. It's good reason for me saying that. So what a lot of people don't understand is that Dolby Atmos is all about metadata. And I'll tell you this and keep saying it, there is no metadata in a speaker. There is no metadata in a speaker layout. The metadata is inside the 3D object panner, which then feeds the Dolby Atmos renderer. Meaning, Having all this equipment that I'm looking around the room at, you know, it's nice. And I've seen some amazing million dollar Dolby Atmos mixing studios. You don't need any of that. You don't need any of that at all. Uh, you just need two things, a laptop and headphones. And you can start mixing Atmos. Of course, I would recommend having like at least a consumer level setup to hear the mix 
back onto. And that is where you're going to run into a bottleneck for like time. You're like, oh, I have this cool effect. Let me try it. Boo, 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 boo. Works out in the headphones. And then you listen to it and you're like, ah, that doesn't really, you know, work out that well in my, you know, home theater. And this is why you would want to have like a mixing studio so that you can mix it on the fly and be like, oh, this is a little bit weird. But for the most part, everything I've done in the headphones pretty much just ended up on the track. So, you know, I think if you actually knew how to produce music, if you knew how to mix, like you could actually get away with making Atmos mixes with just a laptop and headphones. In particular, the headphones I've been using to create all my Atmos mixes and when I was creating anything for the Spatial Audio Calibration Toolkit away from the studio, I was using the Odyssey MM500 headphones, which are not cheap. I have a review video on YouTube. You guys can definitely check that out. It's a pair of headphones that's geared to mixing and mixing engineers. So I figured I would use them, but again, they're not cheap. You could probably get away with some halfway decent headphones for half the price. But at the end of the day, this is what I was using. Laptop, headphones, anytime I needed to do work outside of the studio. And then I would come back into the studio and be like, oh, wow, everything lines up perfectly. And I understand it's an unpopular opinion, 100%. You can make Atmos with a laptop and headphones. I know. Oh, secrets revealed. The secret's out. Everybody's going to hate me. They're going to hate. More hate. Bring it on. All right, now let's talk about upgrades. Upgrades, upgrades. So the main things I'm looking at upgrading are adding more speakers. I wanna have two height speakers in the middle of the room, right? So that'll be my third set of height speakers. So I'll have front height, rear height, and middle height. And then I was gonna add the front wides. So effectively, I'll be running a 9.1.6 mixing studio. And then at the same time, I would need some sort of AV processor here in the studio to check the mix. One of the consumer level AV receivers or preamp processors, you know, like the Marantz AV10 or something crazy like that, which is going to add more and more and more cost to this setup. But hey, you know, everything's going well, so might as well do it. And I do have a feeling because I know I've been getting asked this question um, just recently, actually, you know, can I make a Dolby Atmos mix specifically for a 5.1.2 configuration? And the answer to that is yes, I can. Anyone can, right? You just have to figure out what you need to do and how to manage your objects so they don't cross certain areas. And it's easy, relatively easy, okay? Not super easy, but it can be done. So that begs the question, you know, if Atmos Matrix is so well, you know, if I make a 5.1.2 mix of a song and I mix the song on 9.1.6, I could just send you guys those files and you can play it on your systems and be like, oh, things are different. Sounds are moving differently and they're getting bunched up in certain areas because you don't have all the speakers. So it's pretty interesting. I would also wonder... You know, I feel like the Atmos configuration that would probably be the optimal in a home theater would be 7.1.6. So I, uh, yeah, got a lot of figuring out to do and I can't wait to continue my journey mixing Atmos. I've got another new Atmos remix coming at you. Oh, it's going to be so good. You guys are going to love it. And um, that should be released in the next month or two. And uh, if you're wondering why it takes so long, like, I don't know how these you know, Hollywood people do it. You know, if they only get like a month to do an entire movie, it takes me like a month uh, to mix like a four minute song. And of course, make it sound cool the whole time. You know, obviously in a movie, things aren't like flying around you all the time. So I understand that. But I can't wait to uh, mix my first uh, full length feature film in Atmos. That would be pretty awesome. And, you know, that's going to happen. So a lot of cool things happening, a lot of big things happening here, not just for the channel, but also for me. And yeah, I can't wait to see what the future holds. Thank you so much for watching my little tour here. If you have any questions about any of the gear, you know, uh, put them in the comments. I'll try to get to them as best I can. And I will try to link up everything I have here in the studio down in the description if you guys want to check those out. Again, this stuff is not cheap. OK, but unpopular opinion, you can start mixing Atmos with one laptop and one pair of headphones. OK.
Preferably not earbuds. But anyway, that's it. Okay, bye. Thank you.